Welcome to my study. After 30 years, I've concluded that everything you need to know to be successful in every part of your life is found in one book, the Bible. Welcome today, a uh, great subject we've got, God's Great Agenda for you. Yes, for you. Now, it's always nice when people have good plans for you. Uh, obviously, some people's plans for you are not all that great, but here's what God says. He says, I know the plans I have for you, saith the Lord. They are thoughts of good and not for evil, and to give you an, ex uh, an expected conclusion, an end to it. He's looking for your prosperity. He's looking for you to be blessed beyond your measure, and that's why our subject today is God's agenda for you and for me. We're talking about God now. We're not talking about some guy down the street who's got some plan for you or some relative mother-in-law. <laughs> I always laugh at my mother-in-law because she's the only woman in the world that gets a, a two jokes, a two laughs out of every joke. I tell one when she hears it, the other when she understands it. But look at the scripture now. In my father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, I'd have told you. And I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am they there you may be also. One scripture says, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavenlies. Ah, talking about our bodies here. Now, this great scripture in Thessalonians says that there are celestial bodies and, and bodies terrestrial. And in fact, it goes on to say that the glory of the celestial is one, but the glory of the terrestrial is another. And so what does all this mean, in fact? And it's really simple. Because there's coming a day when we're going to leave this planet. And that same scripture says this body, this mortal body, shall put on immortality. And this corruptible body shall put on incorruption. In other words, right now, your body is very limited, but you're going to get a new body. And in fact, this body that you have is corruptible by disease and intrusion by knife, bullet, or whatever else, uh, puncture. But you're going to get one that's not corruptible. In fact, one of the most interesting things I know and, and, and about the future is the promise in Philippians where God says the uh, uh, where it says to us that this, uh, not not this mortal shall put on immortal, that's in Thessalonians, but this one says, he shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like and unto his glorious body, according to the working of the power, whereby he is able to subdue all things to himself. He had control over the molecular structure of the universe after his resurrection his glorified body, right? He went to heaven and came back. Well, if he was going at the speed of light, it would take a long time to get there. But he doesn't move at the speed of light anymore. God, Jesus, after his glorified body, moves at the speed of thought. And he's given you a body that can move at the speed of thought. I don't know how many millions of light years away the headquarters city of the universe is heaven. But if it's uh, even if it's a million light years away, I, I don't want to take a million years to get there. So he intends to have a new body for you that's fully capable. In fact, in one place it says that he appeared unto them in the upper room, the doors and the windows being locked or barred. He just showed up, just materialized. So when the scripture says the glory of uh the glory of one body is celestial, but the glory of the terrestrial is quite another. And then the scripture goes on to say, as we have borne the image of the earthly in our physical body, we shall also bear the 
image of the heavenly. Oh my goodness, is this delightful or not? I mean, we're going to have a transformed body. And in fact, that's what brings us to our subject, that God has an agenda for you and for me. He has an agenda. And it's phenomenal. It's beyond imagination. Nobody could write a book with such a story in it because it's stranger than fiction and better than anything you've ever heard before. God has an agenda for you. And it's a big one. I mean, it's really big. It bypasses just the size of the planet in which we live. We'll go back to the scripture. As we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. So you're going to get transformed from an earthly body to a heavenly body, which I've just explained some of the details to you about, about that. But what I want, really want you to grasp is some basic ideas about this. Look at the scripture. That in the ages to come, ages to come, ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace. Wow. In fact, one thing he says, I'll give unto them eternal life. Here's the plan. He wants to take a people from this planet after they did die or get raptured, whatever happens. He wants to take a people from this planet on into the universe to be with him to give them forever or eternal life. It isn't just about going to heaven, headquarters, city somewhere. That's certainly true that it's headquarters and we'll be coming and going from there. But he's got really big plans. We're talking about somebody whose enterprises are beyond imagination. We're talking about the God who scooped out the seas, piled up the mountains, and zipped up the mountains with a stream. And we're talking about the God who huh, just sowed galaxies into the universe like a farmer sows seeds into the field. We're talking about this great creator of God, and he says he wants to give you eternal life. And look at this. And this is what will happen. They will never perish, never perish never perish. Now, you have to understand with me that God is a God of judgment and care and wisdom. But um, he's got this promise for you. He's got this agenda for you. Look at this. And this is the promise that he hath promised us even eternal life. Wow. What a promise. And then he says, Whosoever liveth and abideth in me shall never die. That's the agenda. A never death, never dying life. Eternal. Now watch this. In the heavenlies. Oh, my goodness. Now, if you were God, let me ask you this question. If you were God, would you give everybody eternal life? Would you give everybody free access to the universe? Would you give them supernatural bodies like we've talked about, where they could go into the whole universe and do whatever they wish to do? I think not. So God knows how corrupt we have been. So he wanted to do something about that, and hence the cross, where he took our sins and our sorrows and he made them, as the hymn writer said, his very own. So we could get over all the past wrong that we've been doing and start a new life. And this new life, which is so different from the old life, is the one that he can trust. It's the one that he wants to give eternal life to because now 
Let's go back to this diagram. He can trust you out here in the universe. He can put somebody over here and somebody over here and give them great powers. And he can trust them. And, and why is it? It's basically because of this one condition, which we called love. Anybody who has the ability or exercises the option to love, that's the qualification for eternal life. So look at this scripture now. Love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knows God. So he's looking to bring people who are qualified, redeemed from their wrong, living the right way, loving everyone all the time in every circumstances. Now he can trust people who love. Uh -huh. In the universe, with eternal life, with supernatural abilities to participate in his big agenda. <laughs> the biggest enterprise beyond imagination. So, you see, we've got to be careful here. He went on to say, and this is, this, we must not leave this love thing here. Let's go back, take a look. By this shall all men know you are my disciples. If, if, this is the biggest little word in the English language, or if. If you have love one to another. So he's watching to see who of us here lives by this law of love. Because if we are lovers, he can take us on in the universe, give us supernatural powers and responsibilities, and we'll do love. What is that? Love is choosing the highest good of God and his universe and others without personal benefit or profit as a motive. You see, the motive, the basic, as, as soon rather, as soon as the selfish motive gets involved, things change, don't they? Ah. So uh, watch there this now. Because the scripture says that he that loveth not does not know God, because God is love. He rules his philosophy and the whole universe is love. And anybody who will join him, get redeemed from their past and become a lover, like he is, qualifies to be in the universe with him. He can give you eternal life without worry. Watch the diagram with me a bit longer, though. Imagine with me that God put somebody in the universe who was selfish. Let's say he gave them control over a galaxy. And then there's another selfish person over here, and he has a galaxy too. Now, if God gave eternal life to these selfish people, this guy would want what this person has, he would want what this person has, and we would have a war in the universe that makes Star Wars look like a firecracker, doesn't it? So what is this condition from which we have to be redeemed and from which we have to be changed. And I use the word narcissism. It's the common basic issue. It's egocentricity. The Bible word for it is iniquity, iniquity. And that was what Satan, Satan, by the way, let's go back and look at this universe for a minute. Because once upon a time, Satan had lots of access up here and what did he do? The scripture says that he became a narcissist. The actual scripture says this, Lucifer, thou wast perfect in all thy ways until iniquity, narcissism, was found in you. And what was that narcissism? Here's what it was. He said, I, that's the problem right there. The very person who's dead center in the middle of the word sin. The very person who's in the middle of the word pride. You see, once we have a personal agenda, and that's what he got, he decided, and this is what he said, I will exalt my stars above the stars of God. That's narcissism. That's iniquity. 
He said, I'll exalt my throne above the throne of God. Five times in one little passage. I, 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 I. And you turn selfish. Let's go back to the diagram for a moment. So if these, so Satan was up here, right here, and Satan had, and so what happened? He could no longer have access to the universe because he would contaminate the whole universe. And so he got kicked out and was cast down and limited to the planet Earth. I don't know. I really hope you catch this. Because if God were to let selfish people go into his universe and have eternal life with which to do it, they would utterly contaminate. They would all, they would turn the whole universe into a war zone, just like they have done here on planet Earth. So a loving God has to has to have some qualifications for this. And so he says two things. He says, number one, I want I will forgive and cleanse you from all your past wrongs. Because if you don't get out of that, you can't come forward. You can't have eternal life with that stuff because it would mess up the whole universe. Yeah. So I will cleanse you. I will forgive you. That's what the, that's what Jesus did on the cross for you. He took your place so that you could be set free from all your past. And going forward, we no longer live selfish. In fact, the scripture says, that we who are saved should no longer live unto ourselves, but unto him who died and rose again. In fact, Jesus actually put it this way. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Look at this. Deny selfishness. Take up his cross and follow me. That's what has to happen. Now, I haven't got time at this moment to give you all the details about narcissism. So what I want you to do is to consider purchasing this book. It's probably one of the best I've ever written. Originally, it was called How to Conquer Iniquity. Changed the title, did a little edit to it, How to See Yourself. You can get it on Amazon or, or you could go to our website, nothingbutthetruth.org, and you can find it there. What's important, though, is that you understand what the problem is. Remember, he that loveth not knows not God, for God is love. Now, here's the hard part of the story. If you were God and you had bunches of people who refused to live logically, principally based, lovingly, but only acted out of their narcissistic, egocentric drive, grabbing and clutching and grasping for themselves at the expense of God, his universe, and everybody, what would you do with them? What would you do about them? And so, I want you to look at this scripture. Because here's what God says. These shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous unto and into life eternal. All right. I know this is a tough question and a tough issue. How can a loving God have a hell, a place of damnation. If God's a God of love, how can he do that? I was asked that same question on a college campus and McGill University was. And the answer was just given to me right away. How can a loving God not have a hell? Do you think it would be loving for God 
to give eternal life to the narcissist, to damn and damage the entire universe? That's not love. No. A loving God has got to confine the narcissism to a locale. Right now, we are limited to planet Earth. But there's coming a day when there will be a place, and watch again, watch again here, the scripture. There has to be a place of confinement, of restriction, and thus hell. Hell is like the Alcatraz of eternity. You can go there and you won't hurt anybody. You'll be locked in. The scripture says your worm dieth not. You still do whatever you want to do, but under confinement. And it will not be nice. These shall go away unto everlasting punishment. But the righteous shall go to eternal life. So it's a place of confinement, of restriction that prevents people from being able to damage and damn the rest of the universe. It's like a, an insane asylum with rubber walls. It's certainly not a very nice place, but it's necessary to confine and restrict selfishness. And so a loving God, in fact, you go to our website, nothingbutthetruth.org. I, I think I have a video teaching then how can hell come out of the love of God? You need to understand the justice of God and make sure that you get it straight. <clears throat> now, in contrast with this, having to be confined and restricted, imprisoned, if you please, and by that way, haven't we already learned there's no satisfaction in selfishness and narcissism? It's an endless grab for something more all the time. There's no peace. There's no composure. There's no calmness. It's aggravating because you're being pushed and you're being driven by this energy to get, 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 get. In contrast with this, I want you to see what God's agenda for you is. Here it is. He wants to say this to you. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things right here on planet Earth. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. What is that? Entering into this great enterprise boundless in dimension, exquisite, articulate in construction, controlled by Almighty God and inviting you, if you qualify, to participate with him in for his forever plans. And notice it takes eternal life to do this. There's no end to this. My goodness. Most people think that heaven's going to be like with sit around on a cloud and uh, eat ice cream or something. I don't know. Uh -uh. There is a headquarters city from which we'll be going and coming. We'll commission, and I tell you what, we'll join angels and seraphims and cherubims to participate in the greatest enterprise in the whole universe. This is God's agenda for you. But the question is, how can how can we qualify? How do we qualify? What, what does he do? What can we do to make sure that we are loving? How shall we know that? And so I want to take you now to the conclusion of what we're really after here. God's agenda for us is to be like his son, Christ Jesus the Lord. That's his big intention. Take a look. And watch this premise. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are calling to called according to his purpose. My, this is great. 
the Phillips translation says, to them that love God and go according to his plan, everything fits together in a pattern for the good. What is this now? The question becomes, what is the good that no matter what happens to you, good, bad, or evil, you can handle it. You know how not to get upset over problems and issues because your problems are stepping stones and not stumbling blocks. Isn't that what? Let me see if I can quote Timothy for you, uh, Philip's translation. When all kinds of trials and temptations crowd into your lives, my brothers, don't resent them as intruders, but welcome them as your friends. Oh. Realize that they've come to test your faith and to produce in you the quality of endurance and in the, in the process. Any of you does not know how to meet a particular problem. is only ask of God, who gives generously to all men without feeling guilty or ashamed. Well, make sure you ask in seriously your faith. See, everything. I mean, this is an amazing promise. But what people fail to realize is, why does God want everything working for your good, whether it's good or bad, whether it's up or down, whether it's comfortable or antagonistic. And here's the answer to the question. For those who did before come to know, he predestinated, this is predestined, this is the only predestination, predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. He wants you and I to be just like him. Look at translation. For from the very beginning, God decided that those who came to him should become like his son. Oh my. Do you understand how great this is? The big agenda includes the agenda of us becoming Christ-like. Now, watch this now, because Christ's likeness then, because it's so important, because that's why you can be given space in the universe and activity and function and duration, right? Christ's likeness is that important. And so thus, it ought to be the goal of every ministry. It was that of Paul. He said, I travail in birth again. It's like I'm having a baby all over again. Look at the goal. Until Christ, until Christ be formed in you. He had it straight. The ministry must be designed around getting people to be just like Jesus. Because then they can be heirs. And isn't that astounding verse? Listen to this one. That he has designed you to be an heir, the scripture says, and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. He's, he's going to be your elder brother. I mean, we're going to be with him forever in the universe. Goodness sakes. Now, I don't know where you're at in your Christian life right now. But, and I don't know where your struggles are. I don't know what you have to overcome yet. But what I can tell you is this, that, Christ-likeness is a sufficient achievement. Don't have to worry about anything else. Just be like Jesus. That's it. Look at the scripture now. It is enough. I don't want you to miss it. It's enough. It's good enough for a disciple that he be as his master and that the servant be as his Lord. Oh, goodness, get this. It's sufficient. It's enough to be Christ-like. So stop worrying about everything else. And let's concentrate on what God's agenda is for us in view of the eternity of it, to be like his son, Jesus. Now you say, well, that's probably really difficult to be. And I want to tell you otherwise that Christ-likeness is very easy. Look at this scripture. It's the way of the transgressor that's hard. Come on, have we not figured that out? Do we really think that lying makes life easy? 
<laughs> or stealing or committing fornication or adultery. Or, what do you think? Like, oh my goodness. The way of the transgressors are. That's why God comes with wisdom for men. And this is what he says to every man. Give not thy strength unto women. Mm -mm. Now you can use your strength for women, but don't give them your strength. Because when you start violating, if I start violating the principles, the moral principles of God, the way is really hard. So Jesus puts it this way. Come unto me. Isn't that a wonderful invitation? All ye that are laboring, you're working at it, and you're, you're carrying a heavy burden. And he said, I will give you rest. You can chill. Being like Christ is easy. Watch it now. He says, take my yoke upon you. You know, you know that the yoke was designed to take two beasts, oxen or otherwise, who may have different power, pulling abilities, but the yoke connected them so that the so that the weaker didn't have to didn't die of overexertion because the stronger was pulling stronger than the weaker. It sort of evened out the load. And Jesus says, take my yoke on you and learn of me. Figure out how I do things. And then he says an astounding thing. He says, I am meek. Ooh, ooh, ooh. And he says, I am lowly in heart. No more narcissism, no pompous activity here. Because he says, if you do it this way, you'll find rest to your mind and your emotion. But it gets better. He says, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. It Christ-like is easy. And you may still be saying, well, it doesn't seem that easy to me. And that's why I want you to see the next point. And it's simply this. That Christ's likeness, and you're zealous to be like Christ, is going to bring a power into you that will give you the ability that you may think you do not now have. So here it is. Christ's likeness is empowered by God himself. Look at the scripture. This is delightful. Is God, which worketh in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. You, you don't have to do this alone. All you got to do is be willing. And he will, he, oh, this is so, so, so delightful. He will come alongside and help you. Another great scripture that I like, and I, I put it in because I want you to see it. Because there's something beyond the redemptive work of Jesus on the cross that happens because, not of his death, but because of his, rec his resurrection, see? So this scripture comes along and it says, much more than just being reconciled, which is by his death, we shall be saved by his life. We actually, <laughs> we actually, we, we actually get Christ coming in to empower us. In fact, this scripture is so, I want you to see this one. Christ in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. I mean, he comes walking out of the pages of the Bible. He comes walking through the centuries. He comes walking into your life right now by his Holy Spirit and takes up resident. And that's why you can be Christ-like because he's empowering you on the inside. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And the, and the preacher went on to say, whom we preach, and we warn every man, and we teach every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. So God comes along to us in power. I want you to know this too, that Christ's likeness is a necessity, not an option. If you want to cash in on God's great agenda for you, you cannot look at this thing as an option. This is the way. That's why Jesus put it this way. 
He said, I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. And no man comes to the Father except by me. I am the way. You'll never get lost. I am the truth. You'll never be confused. I am the life. You'll never be depressed. It's not an option, though. He is the only way. I am the door by me, if any man enter in, Jesus said, he shall be saved. You see, narrow is the way that leads to eternal life, but broad is the way that leads to destruction. Christ's license is not an option. And then, almost in conclusion, Christ's likeness is the evidence of authenticity. Jesus comes and he asks this question, why do you call me Lord and not do the things I say? Wait, you're wasting your breath. See, if we do what he says, we will be Christ-like. But there are people who say, Lord, Lord, but they don't do what he says. And they think, oh, my friends, this is frightening. They think they're on their way to heaven. I am. Um, I guess I, I need to say this. The most terrible thing that can ever happen is happening. And it's fake Christianity based on what I call the no lordship gospel. You know, they drop Jesus up in all these pieces. He's the savior, baptizer, healer, coming king, Lord. And we offer like a smorgasbord buffet. You take the part of Jesus you want and leave the rest. Of course, I want to be saved. Who wants to burn in hell? If they think, ah, nah, it's not enough to say the words Lord. You see, genuine Christianity, authentic Christianity is a change of government from, from narcissism from self-rule to Christ's rule. I don't know about your experience, but mine with others, I have so frequently heard, if that's what a Christian is like, I don't want to be one. And they're pointing at fake Christianity. People described by this passage of scripture that Jesus said, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, all that star universe we've been looking at. Not everyone that says, Lord, shall, shall can enter into this heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Oh, my goodness. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful things? Well, look at all the religious things we did, God. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from ye, ye that work narcissism. Whoa. This is a big issue. Fake Christianity. No authenticity. What shows genuine authenticity? Christ likeness. Christ likeness. I want you to take this final point because Christ likeness is achieved by simply following his example. He's the model, we walk in his steps. Look at this promise. Righteousness shall go before him and shall set us in the way of his steps. Ah, that's what he wants to do. And look at this scripture. Here unto you were called because Christ suffered for us. Now look at this. He left us an example that we should follow in his steps. That's how simple it is. That verse is followed up by, he wants us to follow in his steps, who did no sin, 
No guile or bitterness was found in his mouth. When people reviled him, he didn't revile them back. When he suffered, he didn't threaten people. But he committed himself to him that judges righteously. It's about following in his steps. And may I suggest to you, everybody should read this book. I'm not the author, but it's written by Charles Sheldon. It's called In His Steps. Um, it's in a relatively inexpensive, viewed by, I would say, 50 million people. In fact, when I became a Christian at the age of 18, it was the first book I read after the Bible. And it changed my life. Learning to walk in his steps. A long time ago, when I was a boy, a preacher came to our town and he told a story. I'd like, you may have heard it before, I hope you'll bear with me a second time if you've already heard it, but it's so important. The story takes place in the Midwest decades ago when there wasn't a lot of transportation, but there was a train that came through this little town, little village, oh, once a month. This little boy had lost his father in the war and just he and his mother were left to take care of themselves. And so she cleaned homes and he wanted to help his mother. So what he would do is every Friday, he would get a bunch of apples and he would shine them up really bright red. Had a little six quart basket, put the apples in, he had some cellophane paper around them, a white cellophane paper, so it made the apples really look bright red. And then on Saturday morning, he'd go down to the railroad station and wait for the great Chicago flyer to come in. And when the people came off the train, he'd hold up his basket with a little sign on it that said, apples five cents, and he'd make money to give to his mother to help him. <clears throat> so one Friday night, he's, he, he was always excited about this. So one Friday night, he polished his apples and he could hardly sleep because he, and he knew when he got up in the morning, he'd have to pass inspection. So when he got out of bed in the morning, he did his fingernails, washed his face, and passed inspection, and off he went down to the railroad station and he stood as a lone figure on that great big long giant gangplank way, waiting for the train to come. Excitement. Make some money for my mom. He felt the first few tremors in the air. He knew it was coming. And then more tremors. And, and then finally that Chicago flower came steaming and snorting around the corner and screeched to a halt right up beside the little boy. And he stood there with his basket up. At various points along the train, conductors stepped out, put stools down. And then it seemed like, it seemed to that little guy like hundreds of people started coming down the gangplank right towards him. He held his basket up. He don't remember so many people before. And in the hurry and the scurry, somebody accidentally bumped into him and knocked him over. His basket fell down. The apples tumbled out. His five-cent sign got trampled on. And then it seemed like the crowd vanished just as quickly as they had come. And all of his chances of making money were gone and the train pulled out of the station and there he was, a lone, sad, weeping little boy. And at that moment, there appeared a tall, dark, handsome stranger, dressed in a suit, looked at the little boy, went over, picked up the little kid, took out a white silken handkerchief and wiped the tears from the little boy's eyes, picked up the basket, went over and got the sign, Apple's Five Cents, and dusted the footprints off, put it back in the basket, and then he started picking up the apples where he could find them. Some of them had fallen down by the train tracks along the broken glass and the cinders, and so he jumped down and he picked up those apples, and with the same handkerchief, he cleaned them as best he could, put them in the basket set the basket by the little guy. And then he reached into his pocket and he pulled out all the loose change, a handful of change, quarters, nickels, dimes. 
opened the little boy's hands and dropped it in. The little boy looked up and he said to him, Sir, are you Jesus? I've often wondered how many people could look at my life and mistake me for Jesus. The way I talk to people, the way I respond to difficulties, my mannerisms, the activities of my life. I want to challenge you as well as myself with the same question. Can people look at you and see Jesus. Christ likeness. It's God's agenda for us that leads to eternal life. Do you ever wonder how to handle that difficult person in your life? David L. Johnston has a free ebook just for you How to Handle Difficult People. Get the free ebook today by going to nothingbutthetruth.org forward slash difficult.